Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and one of the most controversial, sometimes contentious subjects in the American Jewish community today centers around an organization named J Street. J Street self-identifies as pro-Israel and pro-peace. It was founded in 2007, shortly before Barack Obama became president, as an alternative to APEC, which many liberal Jews viewed as too conservative and too compliant with Israeli policy, especially as it pertained to the treatment of Palestinians on the West Bank by the government of Israel and by the IDF, the Army of Israel. And J Street lobbied Congress to pressure Israel to be more proactive in working for a two-state solution. Now, for many American Jews who see themselves as liberals and progressives, they believe it is essential for American Jewry to use its political and financial strength to help Israel fulfill its founding principles of being both a democratic and Jewish state. And for JHP to do all it can to influence every American administration to help Israel live in accordance with Jewish values of respect and dignity and empathy for the other. In this case, both the Arab Israeli and the Palestinian on the West Bank. And therefore, J Street feels a responsibility to publicly criticize Israeli policy whenever it feels Israel has fallen short of Jewish values and the democratic principles of Israel's Declaration of Independence. Now, in contrast, there are many American Jews who feel J Street's criticism of Israel is too extreme. So extreme, in fact, that they undermine, the criticism undermines Israel's legitimacy and threatens Israel's well-being. Many American Jews feel J Street's criticisms of Israel do not reflect the reality of life in Israel or on the West Bank, and they claim J Street unwittingly or wittingly promotes lies about the Jewish state as if they are true. An example of this issue of criticizing J Street or not has to do with J Street's endorsement of what was called the Goldstone Report, which charged Israel with war crimes against the Palestinians of Gaza during Operation Cast Lead in January 2009. Israel's military action in response to hundreds of rockets fired by Hamas in Gaza into Israel. The Goldstone Report stated that Israel deliberately targeted civilians during Operation Cast Lead. When the report was published by the United Nations, J Street was approving, as a, say, it, as that, saying it was a true and accurate portrayal of IDF, IDF actions. Yet for many Jews, the Goldstone Report was a hideous, anti-Semitic canard and a blatant lie reminiscent of the hideous blood libels heard at Jews over the century claiming Jews used the blood of Christian children to make matzah on Passover. It should be noted that in 2011, Justice Goldstone publicly renounced the findings of his report. But by then, the damage had been done, both in terms of public opinion and in the actions taken against Israel by the United Nations. For many Jews who are critical of J Street, it supported the Goldstone Report as symptomatic of a perspective which sees Israel as the bad guy. Israel's responsible for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and for the failure to achieve a two-state solution. Critics of J Street also claim that while the organization says it does not support BDS, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, 
designed by its founders to destroy the state of Israel. The fact that J Street welcomes leaders of the BDS movement to speak at its annual national conventions in Washington is somehow tacit support of BDS. And for these reasons, many mainstream American Jewish organizations have argued that J Street is not what is normally meant by pro-Israel, and that J Street does not merit being included in the large tent of American Jewry. And for example, J Street has been denied membership in the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. Now for the record, while I have been critical of J Street here on JBS, and while I find J Street to be often seriously misrepresenting the reality of Israeli life, I've had on L'Chaim Jeremy Ben-Ami, the president of J Street. I've had on L'Chaim Peter Beinart, a leading Jewish commentator on the left who's identified with J Street. And I've taken criticism for having had both Jeremy Ben-Ami and Peter Beinart on JBS. And while I personally feel they are both seriously mistaken in their positions on Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I personally do not doubt their commitment to an enduring state of Israel. And I like them as people. I simply feel they present a reality that is very different from the one Israelis and Palestinians actually live with day to day. And that brings me to my very special guest on this edition of L'Chaim. There are many rabbis on the American Jewish scene who support J Street and believe its goal is to help Israel become the Jewish society it was founded to be. On the other hand, there are those who believe J Street is undermining the state of Israel, and they therefore find it difficult to understand what motivates a rabbi to be part of J Street. Now, rarely do we have the chance to engage in discussion with rabbis who support J Street. And even rarer is there discussion that is respectful, if passionate. Well, on this edition of L'Chaim, I have the opportunity to sit with, first, one of my favorite people in the Jewish world, and one of the leading figures in the American rabbinate today, a real superstar in the Jewish academic world, who spent more than four decades as a leading light at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, known to everyone as JTS, which is the conservative movement's rabbinical school, educational college, master's program, and cantorial school. It's my pleasure to be sitting with Rabbi Bert Visofsky, who in addition to being the Appleman Professor of Midrash and Interreligious Studies at the Jewish Theological Seminary, he has been profoundly engaged in interfaith relations, directing JTS's Milstein Center for Interreligious Dialogue. And Bert Fisoski has been in the forefront of conservative Judaism's commitment to social justice and public policy, serving as the Lewis Stein Director of the Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies at JTS. Rabbi Bert Vizofsky is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he is a member of J Street. It is wonderful to always be sitting with you Thank at you. this table, and it's also very sweet of you to say you'd sit with me and discuss what is a volatile issue in the Jewish community, the, the question of why of support of J Street and what J Street is, and is it pro-Israel, and why does it take the stands it does, and how does a rabbi who is committed to Jewish life in the state of Israel, a supporter of, of and a member of J Street, so the fact that you would be willing to sit with me and to let me just throw every question I can at you and give you a chance to answer is very kind of you, and I also, I, you should understand. First, Bert and I know each other, and I will ask him every hard question I can. But I'm sitting with a man who has a profound love for the Jewish people, the Jewish tradition, for Torah, and the state of Israel. And my questions of him, even if we disagree, and we've disagreed on Jewish issues as well, whether we disagree or not, I have the highest regard for him. And I hope those of you who are watching, if there are those of you who love J Street, 
You won't get angry at me for asking you the questions. And if those of you, who, those of you watching just can't understand how a rabbi could support J Street, listen to what Bert has to say. It doesn't mean you have to agree, but understand you're hearing the thoughts and the perspective of someone who sees things differently than you, but is a committed, passionate Jew. All fair? Fair. Um, in fact, the principle that you evoke, that we should listen to one another and be able to critique one another in open, honest dialogue, is, I think, the principle that motivates J Street. Okay. So first of all, explain to our audience. And you, you know, I've laid out why there are Jews who say, well, J Street is not really pro pro Israel because it is willing to so publicly criticize Israeli policy. So the first question is is just general. What do you feel were the fundamental or are the fundamental reasons that you are comfortable with and want to be a member of J Street? So let me start by saying that I am a Zionist. I am a lover of Israel, and because of that, and because of that love. And because of my knowledge of discourse as it is played out in Israel, I must be prepared to critique the state when I think they are doing something that doesn't advance their ideals. Um, which is to say, I don't think the issue is J Street. I think the issue is certain Israeli policies, particularly around the occupation of the West Bank. My first trip to Israel was as a teenager. I was 15 years old. I went on a Camp Ramah. Uh, visit to Israel, and I arrived in Israel one month to the day after the Six-Day War. So now that I look back, I think, my God, what were my parents thinking? How could they have had the courage, and it really took courage, for them to not drop out, to not demand a refund, to stay there through the war, and then say, yes, we're sending you. We need you to see what's going on there. And like any 15-year-old, we went and we, we shared the incredible, heady triumph of Israel having won that miraculous war. It was, for me, a phenomenal introduction to a state that I loved from afar, and now there I was drinking tempo and eating falafel. And we who were there, our Hebrew was good enough to have heard Ben-Gurion speak. And one of the things he was quoted as saying led us all to a conclusion that maybe the old man was a little senile. He maybe had Alzheimer's, although we didn't use that term Alzheimer's in those days. We said he was senile. Actually, we probably used the, the Yiddish, Aver Bottle. Um, because Ben-Gurion, in that moment following the Six-Day War, was quoted as saying very clearly, we must give the occupied territories back. They will destroy the state. And we thought, that's crazy. We just got this land. We have all this living space now. We can, we're, we're much safer than we were before. We defeated all these armies out to get us. What's he talking about? Well, that was more than 50 years ago. And I think, sadly, he was not senile. He was prophetic it is at risk of destroying the state. Um, you, in your introduction, said that we want Israel to be a Jewish and democratic state. That's a hard thing to do, by the way, because if you're democratic and the demographics are against you, well, you could get voted enough out of office that the state would no longer be Jewish. That it's not democratic doesn't seem acceptable, although I often wonder whether certain elements in the government might not mind so much if it weren't democratic. Part of the question is going to be, can we live with the Arabs among us? Can we live with Israeli Arabs? Um, to say the least of the Palestinians. Uh, Israeli Arabs make up 20% of the population. The Palestinians add to that a sufficient demographic that were they to come under the Jewish state, it might not be so Jewish anymore. So, I am of the belief, and I share this with J Street, that we desperately need a two-state solution. We need a Palestinian and a Jewish state who learn to live in peace with one another, side by side, who respect one another, who are aware of both Islam, Christianity, Judaism, who can speak Arabic and Hebrew and maybe even a little English. Um, because I have this naive view, and it may still be the view of a 15-year-old, that um, Israel 
triumphant should be Israel at peace with its neighbors. In that same year, 1967, having conquered Jerusalem from Jordan, the word on the street was, never again will there be a wall separating us. And of course, now Jerusalem has a wall, and lots of Israel has a wall separating us. So we have rebuilt with our own hands the things that we thought were horrible. Um, I desperately want the state to be a vibrant Jewish state. I desperately want our Palestinian neighbors to be good neighbors. And I will be the first to say they're not always good neighbors. Um, in fact, sometimes they are terrifying neighbors, terrorist neighbors. Sometimes we are so locked into our discourse that it's as though we're talking about two different universes. I have had the, I don't know if it's a privilege, but the occasion to sit with Abu Mazen and talk about Jerusalem. And he would not even say out loud that there was a historic Jewish presence in Jerusalem. So that's not honest discourse. On the other hand, if the Palestinians want to have their part of Jerusalem, which for a long time everybody knew this is Arab Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, and then there's West Jerusalem, Jewish Jerusalem, I would be very happy to figure out how to share. Maybe 25 years ago, I was quoted in the New York Times as saying, we should learn to share. And I got death threats at JTS for that. How? Hey. JTS? Yeah. yeah, people found my email and they sent me death threats. Oh, they, oh it wasn't JTS people. No, 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 not oh, JTS oh, right. people. It was outsiders, Jews, who were so distraught that we might share God's holy city, what my Israeli colleagues call Ir Amim, the city of the nations. Because Muslims have a claim to Jerusalem, Christians have a claim to Jerusalem, and God knows we Jews have a very long claim to Jerusalem. What's the Jewish claim? The Jewish claim is a biblical claim, that it goes all the way back and we're there now. What's the Islamic claim? The Islamic claim is that that is where, Muslim, where, where Muhammad went up to heaven. And that doesn't there, mean the, he, that's a rock. By the way, you know Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran. I do know that. So what's their claim? The claim is a historic claim over the last 1,500 years where Jerusalem has been the third, and I'll, I'll explain this a little bit in a second, the third holiest city have after to, Makkah have, and explain, Medina. You, have to explain. you understand that from, for people who are outside of J Street, Yes. and there's so much that you said, though there's so much you've said, much of which I think is non-controversial, and I think most American Jews, if they get past the name J Street, would not disagree with you, and I'm, okay. happy, I'm happy to tell you where we, dis, where we agree. But when you then suggest that Christians and Muslims have a claim on Jerusalem like the Jews, in other words, you didn't say the Jews have a major claim. By the way, we understand that those of Islam feel a connection to Israel. That's even a claim. And that Christians who have Rome feel a connection to Jerusalem, because that's where Jesus was crucified. No one would disagree. But, to, but the way you say it suggests that you think Jews, Christians, and Muslims have an equal claim. And to mo most of the Jewish world, they would think you're out of your mind. But I want to ask you now, I want to come back to some of the things you've said, because I want to understand your perspective. OK. And by the way, that's all. I, and I want people to hear your perspective. Thank you. OK. So there's a wall now. Who built the wall? The Jews. What was the first wall? The first wall was the barbed wire wall at the LNB gate that the Jordanians built. What did that wall, what did that, what, what did that wall do? It kept the Jews out. Keep Christians out? Um, in fact, yes. Yes, it did. Okay. And was this because the Jews were trying to kill the people who were on the other side of that barbed wire fence? I suspect the Georgians thought so, yeah. Oh, okay. By the way, what you've done is you've identified one of the differences between those who support J Street and those who don't. I want to, make, I want to articulate it because if I'm wrong, you correct me. Mm -hmm. The reason, one of the reasons, one of the things you see at the moment is that the wall, that the barbed wire, which was built, 
created by the Jordanians at the end of the armistice of 1949, during the War of Independence, where Jordan was part of a number of armies trying to de destroy, obliterate the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't, and at some point there's an armistice, and the Jordanians say to the Jews, you will not tread on the other side. Absolutely. The reason right. they did that was they were convinced that if Jews did come over that barbed wire, they would kill Jordanians. That's what you think. I think Jordanians thought that, yeah. Okay. And, and they thought it okay, and through was the bitter it, experience of the, of the 1948 war. What bitter experience? Because Jews, Baruch Hashem, thank God, the Jews were able to defend themselves and actually beat the Jordanians. In a war. In, in a, a war. war. I, okay. In a war that we okay. did not start. Correct. And as far as you know, no Israeli, no Jew snuck across that barbed wire fence and slit the throat of a Jordanian child. I'm not, uh, I, I'm probably not, I would love to believe not a child, but certainly there were Israeli commando raids against Jordanians and, for what at that purpose? time. For what purpose? For what the Israelis would say, and prob I'm not here to debate it, to protect the state. By the way, you're there telling me, you're any... telling me, you're telling me, you, can, you can cite for me historical reports of Jews going across the barbed wire into the old city of Jerusalem, occupied by and controlled by the Jordanians, to kill Jordanians. If they felt threatened, there has been in the last 20 years, not Americans, not J-Streeters, but Israeli historians who are now uncovering the archives, whether it's of the Haganah, or Lehi, or the other organizations, that the truth is... The Lehi did is not, not operate that... after, the second, after the War of Independence. Lehi did not. Irgun did not. Why would you quote that to me? You know they didn't. And people who don't know hear this conversation, and they think that Bert Fisatsky thinks that Begin kept on, and, and Shamir kept on, and Stern, who was, there, who was dead by that time, was still doing race. Let me... Why did the Jews build their wall? The reason that is offered. Offered? Is offered, and I'll, I'll qualify that in a moment, is that it would prevent terrorist attacks. But you don't think that's the real reason? Um, I think it's one of the reasons, and I will say point blank, it seems to indeed have prevented many terrorist attacks. Since that wall is up, the incidence of terrorist attacks is, I cannot question it, Okay, and I'm saying, down. I'm saying to you, I want you to understand why people are critical of J Street and don't understand why a rabbi who is as committed and caring as you, it just means, by the way, we see things differently, would equate what Jordanians and, and Palestinian terrorists have done to Jews with what Jews have done with to, to Jordanians and Palestinians as if there's no moral distinction or distinction in quality and kind. It's not, by the way, that there has never been a horrific Jewish act of okay. terrorism, bestiality. I don't mean they ate people, but there have been ghastly things. Yes. Okay. They are, number one, few and far between, and they are condemned by the entire Jewish world, including leadership of Israel, except for a far, far, far small right fringe. In the Palestinian world, you've got the centrist Palestinians applauding, encouraging, rewarding, glorifying people who break into an Israeli home and slit the ch throat of a baby in a bed. There, is there can never be an no excuse for there that. can You're right. no but it's worse than that. it's more serious. There can be no uh, no suggestion that there's a moral equivalency between a barbed wire fence created by Jordan and a fence that was created only after years of horrific Terrorist activity where Jews were being blown up in pizza shops and in buses and in nightclubs 
and in Passover halls. And at there the would, university gym. Yes, yes, we lost yes, students. There would, right. There I would be no, no but there would be no wall. There, what, there wasn't a wall for years and years and years. All right, now, Meg, it's, it's another question about the Six-Day War. So you were there. Ben-Gurion makes a very famous comment. We shouldn't keep this territory. He was by no means the only Israeli then who was arguing. We want it. We don't want to keep it. We don't want to keep it. Okay. There are many people who don't know what Khartoum was. So in June of 1967, Israel launches a preemptive defensive war and in six days destroys the armies that were trying to, to destroy it, primarily Egypt under Nasser, and he was joined by Syria, he was joined by Jordan, Jordan although Israel begged Jordan not to enter the war. Absolutely. Do you dispute that? No, I don't okay. dispute that. They believe. begged Jordan. They said to Jordan, we will not take set one foot into what was then West Bank, beyond, beyond the Green Line. We won't step one foot if you don't shoot at us and fire at us. But they shot. Yes, and, and ultimately, the king of Jordan was snookered by Nasser to think that they were winning the war, and, and he's, okay. Now they have won, okay. Do you remember who was prime minister then? You may not, you may not remember, because you were very young. Levi Eshkol. Levi is prime Eshkol, minister. indeed. So Levi Eshkol, and, and by the way, also Moshe Dayan was arguing, we don't want this territory. Indeed. Okay, but he wasn't the only one. Levi Eshkol made an offer to the Arab League. The offer was, I'm not going to say we'll give the law back, because it wasn't going to be given back. We will hand the land over, virtually all of the land over. We want to make accommodations for Jerusalem, and there are some issues of defensive. But for all intents and purposes, Israel says to the Palestinian, to they're not even Palestinian, the Arab League, we will, we will hand over all of the West Bank to you. You create with it what all you want. All we want you to say is, the war is over. We will end hostilities, and we will recognize the legitimacy of the State of Israel. So the Arab League goes... I think there was one more piece, that it would be a um, demilitarized state. Correct. I, by the way, I'm not sure it was that detailed. And then let Eshkol makes this offer to the Arab League. The war was in June. They go to Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, the last week of August. June, July, August, mm -hmm. they meet for a week. On September 1st, they utter their response to Levi Eshkol's offer no, here. No, no, no. No what? No to anything. No recognition no negotiation. No, no, peace, negotiation. no negotiations. No negotiation, no recognition, no peace. Now, Bert, for anyone associated with J Street, to act as if Israel, that Ben-Gurion was, was somehow prophetic and alone, and that the entire state of Israel would have said to Ben-Gurion, what, are you out of your mind? We're going to... When Israel makes the very offer that has been on the table, ah, and let me think, that's I'm good, almost, I'm almost, because almost, it's not just 50 I'm years all, ago. That is we correct. We have continually that, made that yes, offer. Yes, by the way, I argue. it has continually I, been rejected. I'm with you on by that. By the way, Absolutely you say it perfectly. You. And, I'm not arguing with you about I, that at all. Okay, and I want to even come back to something else profound you said. You used the word shared. I have argued <laughs> on JBS. I argue everywhere I go. I teach everywhere I go. It's better than argue. The, Jew, the formal position of the Jewish world, mm -hmm. the Jewish world mm -hmm. from 1936 till today has been, we will share the land. In 1936, the British Peel Commission comes out with a document and says, although this land west of the Jordan River was meant for a Jewish homeland. The Arabs who are living here will never accept it. The only way this will ever work is if we divide the land west of the Jordan River. The, the British had already lopped off all the land to the east of the Jordan River and created Transjordan, which later became the state of Jordan. 
which is not a modern state. It's a state created by, the, by Britain out of what was the Palestinian mandate. Okay. So Britain says to, to the Jews, look, the only way this will work is if you share the land. This was a huge blow to the Yeshuv living in the land at the time. And the Jewish agency, the Jewish leadership met, they debated, and what they ultimately said was, all this land should be ours. We want this to be ours. But you know what? There are two peoples living here. So you know what? We will share the land. The Jews said formally in 1936, we don't like it, but, but we'll we agree to share, uh, to share the land. That has been the Jewish position from 1936 till today. Mm -hmm. It was reaffirmed in 47 when the United Nations affirmed the League of Nations idea of a Jewish homeland. In 47, there's the partition plan, and the Jews once again accept a map created by the United Nations, which we have on the screen right now, which shows a Jewish state that is literally impossible to defend. It is a strip of land along the Mediterranean Sea. All the rest is now going to be the Arab state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And the Jews say, okay, we'll share the land. After 48, when the Jews create a state of Israel, the Arab world says, over my dead body, they invade. And lo and behold, there's the War of Independence that goes until 1949, January of 1949. A ceasefire line is established, and that becomes known as the Green Line, the unofficial but de facto border right. of the State of Israel, which all of us know, and whenever we envision the map, we see the map. Right, that skinny little... Exactly yeah. right. And, we, and the Jews said, fine. And the Jews have said from that day on, any time, any time, the Arab world wants to make peace with us from 67 till this day. And we could go through every single war, every single battle. We can go through every offer made by Barack and Omer and Kerry and, and Obama. And every single time from Oslo through today, tragically, the Arab world has said, I'm sorry, we're not sharing this land. So we, it, for us, it's from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. I, I, and what I, I don't, just, what I don't one, what, Two distinctions. It, one, that now it's not all the Arab states, but yes, certainly still the Palestinians. The only ones who count. Are rejecting. The only ones, the the only ones who are at issue to J Street. J Street's current, concern mm -hmm. is how Israel Palestine. treats the Palestinians. I'm with you. And you and I agree. The Absolutely. Palestinians are irredentist. And what you, when you talked about what you, you had a conversation with Mahmoud Abbas, it was a very disappointing one. Yes, and it was. And by the way, if I'm you, I want Abbas to say anything conciliatory because I want to come back to Israel and say, we can do it. Because, and, exactly. And, and in, at Oslo, 85% of the Israeli people were prepared to give up the West Bank and divide Jerusalem. Yes. Okay. I believe, I believe the same 85% believe the same thing with one caveat. The caveat is they don't believe that there's somebody honest on the other side. I, and if they did, the Israelis I know across the board, left and right, and right, and I, can, I could cite names for you mm -hmm. of Jews on the right, some of whom are major Jewish leaders who would not want me to use their name on t but they'll tell it to me without apology. They will say, if it means my child and my grandchild doesn't have to see, serve in the IDF, right, right. Push, patrolling the West Bank or the Lebanese border or this crazy Gaza, of course I'd give up land. I, and that's the Jewish notion. And so, then I will shut up. And so, so when, I, when I hear, I, when I hear about. I'm about to shut up. Okay. When I hear somebody say to me, I support J Street's position that it's Israel's fault. That's not J Street's position, and J that's Street, an unfair characterization. Just a minute, just a minute. Why is, why is there occupation? So why? Just tell me why there's occupation. First, let's back up just one second, because I think there was one other thing that you said, which is unfortunately no longer true. I think it was true for a long time that Israel would have been happy 
to give back the West Bank and not have an occupation. But the current government of Israel under Netanyahu is talking about annexing the Okay, I'm going, to say, I'm going to say this to you as clearly as I can. Israel is a democracy. You may not like the way they vote, but it's, a th it's an active, working, thriving democracy. And when they can't create a, a coalition government, they go right back to the polls and they vote again. And I don't believe that any government, whether it's Netanyahu or Lieberman or Shas, any gov any no Gantz, by the way is the irony is Gantz on on the issue of peace with the Palestinians is no better no no better no, no worse by the way it's no different I okay. wouldn't say no better fair enough J Street no different J Street would say no better fair enough I would say no different good and in some way that is a microcosm of why people are upset with J Street J Street says no better. Mark and others would say it's no different. It's very interesting to us that the labor, uh, what well, used to be labor, that the left in Israel, yeah. blue and white, with merits and with labor hanging on and Gesher, and all of them would have no difference in policy on the West Bank in terms of peace with the Palestinians than what you and I would call the right. But my point is different. My point is this, that if the Israeli people ever believed the Palestinians would live with Israel as Canada lives with the United States, the Israeli government would have to listen or the Israeli people would throw them out on their ear. And no Netanyahu and no Lieberman and no nobody would stand in the way. And the reason why people right now in Israel support Netanyahu while many of them hate the guy mm -hmm. or feel he's been there for too long right. is they feel that ultimately they're in a war. And that's the other thing I want to hear you talk about. Does J Street understand that when a nation is literally at war and we're at war with the Palestinians every day, we may not be in battle, Battles in war take place periodically, but we're at war with people who want to destroy us and the state of Israel. When a people is at war, when a nation is at war, they're given a wider berth. And the way Israel has conducted itself in the midst of a 70-year war of annihilation is remarkable. The way in which the Arab Israeli is treated in Israel, not simply voting rights, not simply that 16 percent, 16 percent of Israeli universities are now populated by Arabs. Yes, they're 20 percent of the population, and 16 percent of the Israeli population in universities is Arab. There are Arab Israelis who serve on the Israeli Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. They have a party of their own. It doesn't mean, by the way, Parties. yes, sir. It doesn't mean that you and I would want to be an Arab Israeli in Israel, right? But, but, in terms of real life, the way the Arab Israeli says, "Don't ever send me back to a Palestinian state. I want to live right here, because although I want it to be better, and Jews want it to be better, I want it to be better." for Israelis who are poor, for Holocaust, Holocaust survivors who are ignored, and for Arab Israelis who don't have the same rights. Rights is the wrong word. They don't have the same opportunities. But in the grand scheme of things, the way Israel has treated the Arab population and the Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza in the midst of a war is exemplary. And when you say you're against occupation, it sounds like you think Israel's there because it wants to be. Israel would withdraw in a heartbeat. Israel has already said time and time again. And the difference between the J Street attitude and the non-J Street attitude is we weep over Israel's necessity to be an occupying power. But it isn't occupying. It has a responsibility under international law to administer that territory. And any time the Palestinian wants to live in peace with us, Israel has no interest. Israel has one interest. It's an interest you and I share. It can never jeopardize Israeli security. Absolutely. And one of the things that you and I believe, I believe you believe this, is that Israel has an absolute 
right to exist and to be, and to be the legitimate democratic Jewish state of Israel. There are people inside your organization, and it's not Jeremy ben -Ami. It's not. Jeremy ben -Ami is misunderstood. By the way, I disagree with him, as I would disagree with you. But I don't believe he doesn't want Israel to exist. But you've had vice presidents of J Street who have said Israel was a mistake. So first let me be clear. I am a member of J Street. I pay dues. I support it. But I am not J Street. I don't speak for J Street. I don't work you for don't J Street. You don't speak for J Street. No. When you, by the way, you don't have a congregation, so you're in a, in a... Do you ever speak about this to your students? Uh, actually, I'm very careful. I, in my classroom, my job is to teach Midrash. Right. I do not have a platform there to talk about Israel. I think one of the great tragedies of not only American Jewish life, but Jewish life in general, is that Israel somehow has become a topic that is forbidden. That's terrible. But particularly in America, there's a great deal of disagreement about how Israel is, in fact, living out the occupation. We agree totally. Halavai, would that it were so that we could tomorrow sign an agreement and say, we're done. You have your state, we have ours. And the Palestinians, as they famously say, never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. That has been a tragic part of the relationship. But that does not mean, Mark, that Israel has been perfect and that there are not exigencies of the occupation that cause Israel to do things that are regrettable. The exigencies of? Occupation, of, which no, you would call a war. And you don't believe it's a war? I don't believe it is necessarily a war right now. Okay. I think Israel has such overwhelming power, and I want to say Israel overwhelming power, I would never want it to be otherwise. We must have that overwhelming power. But how we use it, and whether we use it as responsibly as possible, you and I might disagree. That said, I also want to be very careful and rare for me, somewhat humble. Um, I don't live in Israel. I have family there, and some of my family I vehemently disagree with because they really think Bibi's a little soft. Um, some of my family I very much agree with, but I don't live there. My kids have not been in the army. I haven't served in the army. Um, I have put myself out for the state of Israel. I speak for the state of Israel. I'm very proud to serve, and I'm very proud that there is a Jewish state. And I want there to be one. And that is my issue. And that's why I I'm am sorry, a supporter. what is your issue? That I want there to be a Jewish state. Okay, but and I'm not sure that under current circumstances, the future bodes well for a Jewish state. Okay. But you were saying something that is, again, I, I think is, you said it so beautifully, but I want you to develop it. Because this is also an area where J Street comes under criticism. Mm -hmm. There are American Jews who say there are certain issues that you've got to leave to let the Israelis decide on their own. That those of us living in the safety of New York or Seattle or Miami or Chicago or Connecticut, where our children aren't, aren't on the front lines. And none of, we, you and I never have a sleepless night. Over the, over the light of life of our child or our grandchild, that we... At least not, a, not in Israel. We have plenty of sleepless nights, I'm sure. But, but you know what I meant. But that puts us in, a, in to use your word, we sh there should be some humility, humility in the American Humility, yes, Jew. but I do not give up my right to criticize. First of all, I'm a Jew. That's like my patrimony. We criticize. We argue. We heatedly argue. Second of all, it is a Jewish state. If tomorrow I chose to make Aliyah, I would love to believe that I still have that right, which means that I can be on the line, and that that right allows me part of the discourse for the Jewish state. I don't vote there, and that ultimately is what decides. And I, I want to point out that in the last number of elections, Netanyahu has never won a majority. It's not well, like he never, that. No, no. He's but, never won a majority. It's not just but, he has. Prime ministers don't win majorities. Well, it, there have been prime ministers, I believe, who have won majorities. But you're right. It is a, a state that cobbles together a Correct. government. Right. It gives, to you my a mind, plura your pr a plurality. Some, it gives some parties way more influence than I wish right. they had. Right. The system is nuts. To which 
uh, just for an example, if I perform a conversion according to every rule of halacha, it will not be accepted in Correct. the state of Israel. But that's not simply because that's not a J I'm issue. an American Jew. That's not what J Street says. That that's is what you one of J that's, Street. That's an issue says. that JTS and the conservative movement, the reform yeah. movement. But that's not what we're talking about here. What, what we're talking about here is this: Do you feel that you know enough, and that J Street knows enough, and that it's J Street's role? to pressure the American administration to withhold aid to Israel based on its policies on the West Bank. So, first of all, I want to be clear that J Street generally advocates for the state of Israel and advocates for the state of Israel most often in foreign aid and military aid, and I would say probably 85 to 90 percent of the time absolutely agrees with APEC, which creates a very interesting phenomenon. APEC people are here, J Street people are here, they speak and lobby House members, okay. they speak and lobby the Senate, and when we are saying the same thing, the House and the Senate are like, oh, wow, they're all agreeing? We're going to do it. So more often than not, J Street's lobbying I don't know why the you House would say this to me. I asked a very specific very question. very pro-Israel. I asked a very specific question. Do you think it's appropriate for J Street? to pressure the United States to withhold aid to Israel because they don't like the policies that Israel has on the West Bank. I think you're asking a question that's trying to be posed as an either or, which requires a much more complicated answer. That's I'm, why I, I, I'll I, listen. I, I, I think depending on the but policy, J Street on has done, J Street takes the position that the United States should withhold aid from Israel until Israel does certain things that J Street believes Israel should do. And what are I, those things? And the occupation. How? And, and curtail settlement policy. Ah, well, I agree that we should You've, curtail okay. settlement okay. policy. Here is, the, here is the disagreement between people who would support J Street and those who think J Street is inappropriate. You believe the Jewish community, pieces of the Jewish community, you and your friends should try to influence, should try to, <laughs> try to, withhold aid to Israel because they're not doing something you like on the West Bank. That's, you're comfortable with that. From, from the perspective outside of J Street, the reason why J Street, to people outside of J Street, view J Street as it's less than pro-Israel, is they would argue the following. Whether I agree with a policy, I disagree, and many, many Jews outside of J Street have profound disagreements with Israeli policy. The one thing they don't agree with is that, the, that they should be it, trying to influence the United States to withhold policy because they, living in Scarsdale and living in wherever in the United States, they don't like what the Israelis are doing on the, on the West Bank in terms of, so, and most of the time, the, Israel, the Jew, American Jews who feel this way have never been to Israel, have no idea what the, what the reality is on the ground, and have never sat with an Israeli or been with an Israeli. But it doesn't matter. What matters is you're comfortable saying that Israel isn't doing what you think Israel should do, That's and fine. therefore America should be pressured not to aid Israel. So let me, let me flip this around for a moment. As a citizen of the United States, I am uncomfortable if I believe that Congress is using my tax dollars to support policies that I believe both short-term and long-term will harm the state of Israel. Give me an example. The, a, my example is the settlements. I think the how settlements... Will that, how will that long-term? Because it is going to make it extremely difficult for there to be a two-state solution. And has there been a two-state solution? Before there were settlements, was there a two-state solution? No, sir, there were not. Okay. And when there were very few settlements, was there a two-state solution? No, sir, there were not. Okay. So we have, and by the way, we might disagree. This is just a disagreement. I've already told you, I'm of the, I am of the persuasion that the Jewish community has always said we'll share the land, and I believe in a two-state solution if... The Palestinians are willing to live with, uh, with, United, with Israel as Canada lives with the United States. Short of that, I don't believe there will be a two-state solution. So, I believe at the moment Mahmoud Abbas doesn't want a two-state solution. Mahmoud Abbas does not think there should be a state of Israel. 
I do not see a Peace Now movement in the Palestinian world. I do not see Palestinian intellectuals writing op-eds in the New York Times blasting Abbas for dragging his feet with negotiations for Netanyahu. I don't see anything in the Palestinian world that suggests to me that we are anywhere near a two-state solution in our lifetime, mm -hmm. Bert, in our lifetime. In the meantime, do I think Israel, do I think, first of all, it's Palestinian land on the West Bank? I do not. Do I think that it belongs to the Palestinians? There's no historical claim, and there's no legal claim. The land beyond the Green Line is of no quali qualitatively difference, no qualitative difference between the land on one side of the West Bank, a uh, Green Line, or the other. And the Palestinian makes that point every single day when he believes Tel Aviv is a settlement. And Haifa is a settlement, and Jaffa is a settlement, and Netanya is a settlement, and Caesarea is a settlement. As far as he's concerned, there's no distinction between Kiryat Arba and Tel Aviv. And as far as the world is concerned, there was land from the West Bank to the Jordan River. It was supposed to be ultimately created for two states, provided two states said they wanted it. The Palestinians said, we don't want it. So, but Mark, you're also saying that from the Jewish side, there is a belief that Kiryat Arba is always ours, that the West Bank is always I don't ours. That. I, all I said was Jews have a right to live on the West Bank, just as Arabs have the right to live in Jerusalem. But wait, I don't want, I, w I would be horrified if an Israeli or an American Jew, and there are some on the very right with fringe, who thinks all Arabs should be put on a truck and, and dropped off so in Jordan. Let me ask you about I, I am I am pleased that there is multiplicity of ethnicities, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Arabs, Jews, living in Jerusalem. And the and state of Israel gives them full rights of citizenship. A, that's not Why entirely it, true. And excuse B, me, what right of citizenship doesn't if, an Arab Israeli have? In, in East Jerusalem, well, one of the simplest ones, which obviously has a good explanation, but it's real, is they can't serve in the army. They can, and they do. This is factually incorrect. They, and they've never been told they can't because they're discriminated against. There was at one point this idea, we didn't want to put Arabs in a situation of fighting their brethren in a war. But there are Arabs who are serving. We had a guy named Yahya Mahmid, a lovely kid, 23 years old, an Arab Israeli from Afula, who comes here and talks about wow, nonsense his, he's being taught. And then he let, I want him to do a show on JBS, I can. Why? He's serving in the IDF. This isn't true. It isn't true, but that's not the issue. The issue is that Israel, you, I can't believe you think there should be a Udenrein place on the face of this earth. I don't and think the there should be a Udenrein okay. place. All right, well, okay, then let think... there be a Palestinian state and let the Palestinian flag fly over Kiryat Shmona. Kiryat, why not? I'll tell you why not. Abbas says he won't tolerate it. Mm. But for you, it's the Jews' fault. It's the Jews who are occupying. It's the Jew and I'm saying the following. I, you, I respect your right to, to see Palestine, to see settlements and the Israeli presence in a different way. We can argue about that. Yeah. The difference isn't there. The difference is I ultimately want, and by the way, I'll, I'll be happy to influence any Israeli yeah. who comes into this room, but in the end, the Israeli goes back to Israel and works it out. And I, my job and your job is to support the Israelis' attempt to create a Jewish, a viable Jewish state in a world where they are at war. And yes, more, maybe our most fundamental difference between those who are part of J Street and those who aren't is that we understand tragically, this is a human tragedy, but it's not caused by the Jews. Human tragedy, the Palestinian people are right now enslaved by a corrupt leadership that would rather see them miserable while they put millions of dollars in their pockets and keep them at war with the state of Israel. We're at war 
with the Palestinian world. I disagree with you that we are actually at war. I am still deeply concerned that Israeli policy in Jerusalem on home building is vastly un uneven and gives rights to Jews that it does not give to um, Israeli Arabs, let alone Palestinians. Um, and I disagree with you profoundly in how you characterize me and I think as well J Street, which is, yes, we do hold Israel partially responsible. Not wholly responsible, partially responsible. We hold the Arabs and particularly the Palestinian Authority also responsible. There are two narratives. No, there are not. not. No, 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 there's no two narratives. That's where we disagree. There's a fa there are facts here. There are, was there two narratives in World War II? Would you have the same thing you said about the Nazis? You know, the Nazis in the, in the West, they had two different narratives. Okay, so they had two narratives. But one wasn't better than the other. One wasn't right and one was wrong. We didn't start the war of 1948. So wait. We didn't start the war of 1967. Are you we have said to the Palestinians over and over again, you can ha we, went to, they, we offered them the West Bank, they went to Khartoum and said over my dead body, we will not recognize you, we will not negotiate with you, we will not give you peace. That's been their position. That's not a narrative. That's a reality. I, I, I don't deny the reality, but I am really disturbed Am I hearing correctly that you would then say that the Arabs, and in particular the Palestinians, are Nazis? Or no, equivalents no. of Nazis? No, oh, please. I never said anything like that. What I said was the concept of two narratives is something that you would not accept if you didn't feel sympathetic to the Palestinian narrative. Of course there I'm is sympathetic. No, well, there, I'm you sympathetic shouldn't to be. all humans. You shouldn't be. They want to kill us, and they, they teach children how to kill at three years old. They teach them how to kill Jews. They pay people who kill Jews. There's no reason to be sympathetic. By the way, it's not that you're not. I'm sympathetic to the Palestinians. You think this is true? Yeah, that, that's, the what, that's yeah, what I, no, I want to hear. No, this isn't about the it's Palestinians. It's not all Palestinians. Of course not. Okay, it's about, let's be clear about it. No, no, but it is and the Palestinians. And those Palestinians who aren't interested in killing Jews, and I think that's probably the vast majority of them. Do they not have a right to a land, a state? I'll say this again. Yeah. I'm for a two-state solution. Okay, so we are in agreement, Yes, and this is a that's, happy moment. That, no, the, the, but I will not let go. Okay. The disagreement is not over that. The disagreement is to what extent do, do American Jews pressure the American government to tell Israel what to do? And most people we do that all the time. APEC does it. Chase Street does it. We always do that because every American has an obligation to pressure their government how foreign aid is spent and how military aid is spent. And it should be spent in the best keeping of the ways in which we think our allies can progress. You and I have a profound difference on what we think is best for the state of Israel. Do we really, by the way, because when you talk... I, it's like you and I agree. Well, because we, we agree on most things, just like J Street and APEC agree on most things. We agree there should be a state of Israel. We agree that Israel has to be militarily powerful. How do you we, answer the BDS issue? I don't like the BDS issue at all. But how do I you like the fact that J Street has BDS leaders come to address their annual convention? J why Street do, why has for? all kind of people come, That's not an just answer. like APEC has all kind no of people No BDS come. person comes to APEC. No, 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 definitely not. But there are. Why people, don't you say I think B, I think J Street is wrong to have BDS people come to address the convention because it gives tacit approval? Uh, because I don't think it necessarily does give tacit approval. What does it do? And I think it allows people who come to that convention to hear arguments on every side of the issue. Now that said, there are places what J side Street of, what side will of the issue not is, go. What is the side of the issue that BDS you think we should? J do? Street does Tell me not about BDS. endorse BDS. Tell, B, the, you know that, the, Mark. No, J Street yes. does not endorse BDS. Well, J Street has gone on record opposed to BDS. So why are you beating them over the head for something I, they don't do? Because they invite BDS leaders to speak. And by the way, it's not that they dialogue with them. They let them just speak. There's no reason for that. There's no reason for APAC, and APAC doesn't do it. By the way, I don't, 
I don't believe you'd be comfortable if JTS wanted BDS people to come speak because you want your students to hear the other side. This isn't the other side. BDS is, we want Israel gone. That's not the other side. I, I think, first of all, the BDS is not so simple. And there is a broad range of belief within the BDS movement. You are certainly right. There are people who are engaged in BDS, even some of their founders, who want there to be no Jewish state. What do you mean some of their founders? All of their founders. But I happen to think that, and here we, we agree and I disagree with them, 100 and 180, is that what we say? Um, right. That, uh, you know, I, I believe in the legitimacy of the Jewish state. I, want I do to be too. Jewish yes, state, I know but you But I do. want it to be Jewish and democratic. And by the way, you have the right to want it to improve. Risk. You have the right to want it to improve. Yeah. And you have the right, by the way, to talk to any Israeli you want. And I and do. Try, okay. The question is, do you want to, is there a purpose in giving aid and comfort to people who don't want what you want? I'm not giving aid and comfort. Of course you are. You and I disagree on of, that. Oh, please. Are you telling me that you don't understand how when J Street comes out and supports the Goldstone Report, that the people who are enemies of Israel say, you see, even the Jews, the good Jews, they understand what Israel is doing. The IDF is an immoral army that purposely, sh we've been told recently, the snipers at the Gaza border are, are going after children and women and doctors. You know that's a lie. Don't you know it's I a lie? I want that to be a lie very You don't much. know it's a lie. I don't know. I want that okay, to be a lie. I feel bad for, because what you're saying is, Bert Fasovsky, as much as he loves Israel, as much as he understands who Jews are, thinks that the IDF sends 17, 18, 19, and 20 year olds to the Gaza border to shoot children. I don't believe the IDF does that, but that doesn't mean it can't happen, precisely because they are 17, 18, 19 year olds, and like all of us, no one is perfect. Are you saying to me that every now and then there is a disturbed Israeli who does something crazy? That's for sure. That doesn't, that's not policy. The argument isn't that there's a crazy here or there. The Goldstone didn't, report didn't say Israeli policy was, but there were some crazies. That's not the issue. And you skirt the issue. And by the way, I understand why. You and I agree. This makes you very uncomfortable. No, I haven't said anything about the Goldstone Report because I think one of the tragedies of the Goldstone Report is that the Israelis refused to cooperate or defend themselves. And that's part of what gave such a skewed report. Had Israel been cooperative, it might have been very different. Okay. You and I can disagree you know, procedurally and, on that. And but, we do, that but we do know this. Richard Goldstone, we before he wrote that report, was a well-known Zionist leader in South Africa. You do know that Goldstone recanted the... Yes, I do. Okay. And you do know that J Street supported the Goldstone report. It was a mistake. Did you support the Goldstone report? When I read the Goldstone report and when I talked to Goldstone at the time, I thought that what he said, and he was very clear about it, was extremely disturbing. I don't believe he was making stuff up. He was reporting what he saw. That's why I'm especially upset that Israel did not do anything to dispel that. But, but you don't mean he saw, he saw nothing. This was all reported to him. He wasn't on the front lines anywhere. No. Okay. you're right. Um, you and I see things so much the same, in the, okay? And, and yet. And, 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 no, it's not even in yet. The difference is very nuanced. It isn't broad. And I'm saying to you that I could talk to other people who support J Street, including other rabbis. They're much more, they're angrier than you. You're not angry. I, I think you're right. You're, you are, you are, you're troubled and disappointed. You're not angry. I can talk to J Street. And, and I don't think you think Israel is the, it's not Israel's fault. But there are many people who think Israel could fix it. I don't I, know. Israel you can't, can't fix, fix it. it, right? Unless you Isn't have somebody else on the other side, right? Who wants Isn't to work that with sad? You. But I'm not sure. I, I think you're right about nuance. Nuance is a very subtle thing, and I think partly J Street gets slammed for people who are further and more angry, maybe, 
And I we're think, not nuanced as you are. But what I want to say is the ways in which we agree, I suspect by and large, are the ways in which J Street and APAC agree. Okay, the one thing we have I, enormous okay. the areas one, of agreement. The one thing I, where we disagree, yes, we disagree as you and I have, yes, heatedly. Yeah, but we, we not terribly heatedly, just passionately. Passionately, not, okay, not passionately. heatedly. That's because uh, I have affection for you. And I to you, yeah, I love you. Respect anyway, is a good thing. Yes, and my point is, does APAC try to to influence the government? Yes, but. It doesn't try to punish Israel. And what J, P J Street says is, you're not acting right. You're like, they're, they're like a parent. And therefore, our influence isn't to help Israel. It's to punish Israel. Mm -hmm. And then after you're punished, you'll change your ways. APEC isn't trying to get Israel to change. What APEC tries to do is say, Israel is in a predicament. We want the United States to support Israel. We want bipartisan support for the state of Israel. Not because we want Israel to be different. J Street wants Israel to be different. And because of that, from the what, what, outside... When, I'm sorry, what do you mean when you say different? It's, it, you want them to change their policy on the West Bank. Yes, I do. Okay. Because you think that they're immoral. No, because I think that the policy they currently have will not serve their future as a Jewish democratic state. Okay, and you know better than Israelis. I'll, ah. And I'll, 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 I'll say, you may be smarter. But wait, what ben Ami's answer is, by being outside of Israel, I'm not, too, I'm not so close, my view is distorted. A very interesting tap dance to me. But you have the right to think you're smarter than the brightest people in Israel who are fighting. You do, you, but you do agree with me no, but that I in Israel, the argu there I are have... more arguments in Israel than there are within the American Jewish community yes. about Israeli policy. And nothing I say doesn't have fervent supporters within Israel. Absolutely. Itself. So I want to be clear but about the one that. Thing they... I'm not inimical to all of Israel. In fact, I share political views with significant numbers of Israelis. Okay. And maybe not the Likud, maybe not even the majority. No, but Haaretz, you represent Haaretz. Indeed. Yes. And it doesn't matter to me whether it's small or large. Right now it's small. That doesn't matter. So there are so Israelis. Give me credit then for I that. do. Don't I say do. That I'm against the state or hate Israel. No, I don't. Oh, wait, I have not said that. The, I've said it on the contrary. I know you love Israel. Good. What I am saying is you think you're smarter. No. And that you, I don't. you're going to use your American power on our American government to correct Israel. APAC is using its power, its influence, to simply get Israel, uh, America, to help. You're not we, getting them to help. We, no, we disagree on that. We really do. How? Because I believe that I want Congress to help Israel much as I'm sure but my But to APAC, be different. Yeah, but to be different much as I'm sure my APAC colleagues do. And, you know, if there were a different government in Israel, God knows when, when or if that will ever happen, um, it might be the case that APAC might find themselves in the role of loyal opposition. Never. Never. Can I just say, I hope that's true. Okay. I want to ask you one more issue on this. Please. Because people have asked me to... Peter Beinart... Mm-hmm. Interviews Barghouti, mm -hmm. the founder of BDS, mm -hmm. via television Skype at NYU, mm -hmm. and gives him, again, a certain degree of stature and respect by interviewing him at NYU. There are people who believe that if you really are against BDS, and you understand that BDS argues from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It's not about boycotting the West Bank. It's about boycotting everything. And do I, do I believe there are American Jews who don't understand enough and they don't mean BDS the way BDS was, is meant by all those who founded it and who understand it and who are SJP and who are, on, who are the BDS movement? Can you unpack SJP? SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine. Okay. Okay. So do I think there are, are, are American Jews, well-meaning American Jews, not only kids, but adults who think that, yeah, the West Bank product should be boycotted 
and don't understand the people it hurts most are Palestinians who who have jobs on the West Bank. That may be true. Okay. Indeed. And you're not and not even, you're not going to change Israeli policy, but BDS is the movement started by Marwan Barghouti with one goal, and the goal is there should be no state of Israel, no two-state solution. The, the, the militants on the Palestinian side are not, are not arguing for a two-state solution. They're arguing for one state from the river to the sea, and it shouldn't be Jewish. I, I does, will not we, defend Marwan Barghouti. Would you, would, does it upset you? And leave Peter Bernard's name out of it. Would it upset you if somebody gave Barghouti a platform at NYU? I think that the Israelis themselves often are in discourse with Barghouti because he is such an articulate and right now, right now, nonviolent or avowedly nonviolent. Um, his past might belie that because he has blood on his hands. But the Israelis do engage him. Is that your way of saying you're not critical? I can be critical, but understand why they do what they do. Then why are you critical? Because we all want some idealized Israel. We want there to be a state of Israel. And the hardest argument, I think, to fight for Israel's future is an argument that is done from a position of nonviolence. And that's, that's a real issue. That's a real problem. So I'm, I'm conflicted about it. No, you're also... I'd much rather, though, that it be nonviolent. Right, and that's what you... Look, you and I both, we dream of somehow resolving the Palestinian mm -hmm. conflict without people blowing each other up or sending airplanes over to bomb... Hey, Rabbi, amen, amen, yes. Yes, yes, we both want that. And then the question is, how do we navigate the present in the meantime? And the... And all I've wanted to do is let people understand what a J Street perspective is. And you have... And again, I want to be clear. I do not... I'm not a spokesperson for right. J Street. I am a supporter, but I'm not a spokesperson. I cannot, nor do I know all the nuance of Jeremy ben -Ami's policies. And I applaud you that you've had him here. Okay. And I guess, I guess to wrap up, what is it that... What is it that pleases you most about what you understand J Street to be, that you would say you are a J Street supporter. It's not about being a supporter of Israel. You are a supporter of Israel. But you're more than a supporter of Israel. You're a supporter of J Street and an orientation that you believe belongs to J Street. Because I believe I have a right as a Jew to criticize the policies of the state of Israel that I disagree with. Oh, who doesn't and, believe that? And, and J Street does that with great articula articulation. Okay. And it doesn't bother you if, if the criticism is that the Israeli army engaged, engages in brutality. It bothers me endlessly that the Israeli army engages in no, brutality. I didn't, no, no, because you believe it does. Of course it does. It's no, an of army. Course, excuse me. No, of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. The Israeli army, not, called, not defined by Jews, is the most moral army on I'm the not, face of the earth. By the way, I'm not debating that it's the most moral. Okay, so That as doesn't a, mean that it doesn't occasionally do things that are brutal and disturbing. It, it never does. If you're telling me that there are individual people okay. who sometimes do something that we are not proud of, nobody, there's, nobody disagrees on that. The question is policy. Is the, pol the policy of the IDF is the most moral and goes to lengths to protect the, the enemy that is trying to kill them in ways that are unheard of? It's our obligation as Jews. But you're proud of that, aren't you? That we have that obligation and no, that we that, carry it out to the yes, best of our ability. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's what people should be saying, especially when we are at war. And that's where, again, we, we might disagree on a, on a given day on the West Bank in a village when the army is there or at a checkpoint. When is the army ever in a village? Ever. When do you think the army is 
ever in a Palestinian village. There were reports of that almost daily. No Israeli army is ever in any Arab village, hamlet, city, unless it's looking for terrorists that it believes are there. Ah, so there is occasion that they are there. Yes, but it's, but it's what you make it sound like is that they're all the time for no reason. No, I didn't say that. Well, I'm not upset if the IDF goes into Ramallah trying to find terrorists who just blew somebody up. Are you upset with that? No, I am upset, though, that if, when doing it, they brutalize innocent people. What does brutalize mean? It can mean just busting their door down at 5 a.m. Okay, if that's what you mean by brutalize. It's it, it the generally definition attested of the as a lot worse. The def like what? What do you think Israeli soldiers do when they're trying to find a terrorist? I think that they will beat people. I think they will Do they beat people for no reason? You think they just no, willy-nilly beat they somebody? They believe that it may get them information they want. Okay, if there's, do you... And here I'm with you, that they are probably in fact doing that against Israeli law. No, they're not. No, they're not. The question is, under what circumstance do you think that Israel has a responsibility to extract information from people who could save Israeli lives? And I would, and by the way, it's not that I think Israeli lives are intrinsically any more valid Good. than a Palestinian. Nobody's blood is redder than nobody's blood. You Good. and I both know we that. Agree. From no, okay. We agree. We totally agree. Absolutely. And I want you to know something else. I've said this a million times on JBS. I have Palestinians who I have been very good friends with. I'm in the hospital. My best friends are Palestinians. The best nurse I have is a Palestinian. When my time is done at Shari Tzedek Hospital, a Palestinian friend has his brother drive me back to the hotel, to the, the Rome in Baldepin. And are those people at war with you? No. Okay. But wait, let me say. Then we, then we are no, really it's totally not about, singing off it's, the it's same It's not page. about the people. It's about the regime. Yes. There was a regime that is at war. So all I'm saying to you is you and I understand that it's not about the people. People, by the way, don't want to be at war. Israelis don't want to be at war. Palestinians don't want to be at war. That's absolutely, we okay. totally agree on that. But and I'm Palestinians really respectful. Right now, Palestinians right now have been incentivized and they have been brainwashed. Mm. They have been schooled into thinking you and I are the descendants of monkeys, apes, and pigs. Mm. By the way, that's their narrative. I'm not denying that. <laughs> their narrative is wrong. You are not a descendant of an ape or a pig. Uh, well, an ape maybe, but <laughs> not a pig. You have been wonderful, by the way. And I, I hope the audience, just all we did was talk, gets to hear there is some major disagreement but, but for you, it's very nuanced, and Look, I, I, I believe that, and this is now arrogant of me, I believe that you, your commitment, which is not one that I disapprove of, your commitment is you want Israel to be the best it can be. Absolutely. And you as a Jew feel you can, should be part of the discussion. Absolutely. I agree. Where you and I part company is, I believe it should be, it should, I believe we are at war. You don't believe we are at war. And I believe that in war, you don't aid, you don't give public aid to the enemy. I have no problem with your telling any Israeli here, they're wrong policies, or if Netanyahu were here, or if any Israeli politician were here, wouldn't bother me if you told them they were, yeah, they were full of it. But that's not what J Street does. What J Street is, it does it publicly. It criticizes the IDF as if it were itself immoral. Not that they're immoral, they're stupid acts, but that it is immoral. It did validate the Goldstone Report and whether Go Israel, Israel had very good reasons for not participating. It was a stacked deck, and if Israel had participated, it would have given credibility from Israel to a stacked deck. I understand why Israel did not go along with the Goldstone Report. And the only question is, once it was published, did Jews 
endorse it or not. Most Jews did not endorse it. J Street did endorse it. And J Street believes it has the right, it has the obligation to convince the, the American government to punish Israel for its inappropriate actions. I want J Street to try to say to the American government, you should always be supporting Israel within Israel, which is a healthy democracy that has many people who, who are far left of you mm -hmm. and who are vocal and who write and who argue all the time. We don't have to worry that Israel is a monolithic, undemocratic, undemocratic society. Exactly. And that in that case, support Israel and let Israel's work, Israelis work it out. In the meantime, in this room, you and I will talk to Israelis all we want. You, you, it's your show, you get the last <laughs> word, and, and we will disagree on many things about the country that we both passionately love. I, we say it again, amen vi amen? Amen vi amen, okay. indeed. And I said, I said this to you all the time, I love you. Thank you. I, 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 even, you know, I have been aware of who you are for years and years and years. I have enormous regard for your, for your academic work, but more for who you are and who you stand for and the Judaism you stand for and the Jewish life you stand for and the contribution you make to who we are is... Well, I want to say that on the Israel J Street piece, you made me think, and I'm grateful for that. And I hope maybe I've made you think a little on that, too. Uh, we say it again. You promise we will continue on any issue at all. You and I will sit at this table often. It's a good argument. Why not? Thank you. I, but oh, that, yeah, well, well, you know what? Yes. <laughs> there we go. Modeling. Yes. Do it again. The elbow bump. And if, six feet. Yeah. Yes. And I would embrace you. You are, you are marvelous. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for all the time. It, it, it was really a wonderful conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Rabbi Bert Fasofsky the Appleman Professor of Midrash and Interreligious Studies at the Jewish Theological Seminary and the Lewis Stein Director of the Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies at JTS. And I hope you found our discussion of J Street and the insights that Bert brings as well help you helpful in your clarifying your own thinking. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of this discussion. You heard on this edition of L'Chaim, please email me this week at rabbigolub at jbstv.org. I love hearing from you. And remember, you can now listen to the L'Chaim podcast wherever you go. Listen to past editions of L'Chaim. Enjoy my conversation with Bert Vesosky. Download the L'Chaim podcast wherever you download the podcast you listen to. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.